Well, Rob Baxter, welcome to the High Performance Podcast for a conversation about building resilience to deal with stress. And we're so happy to be having this conversation with you, Rob, because if there's one thing that we've realized since high performance began, it's that there are genuine parallels between sport and life and the things that you've been learning both on the rugby field and in your role now um, as the director of rugby at Exeter Chiefs are so useful for people in their everyday lives. So thank you very much for joining us. No problem. That's my pleasure. So we start, Rob, with what is your opinion of high performance? What do you believe it to be? I, I kind of keep it very simple. I, I kind of, I've always looked at it as that if we at the club or or whatever I do or the other coaches do, it's it's really about creating an opportunity for someone to to maximize um, maximize themselves, giving them many opportunities to just to just do the best they can do and be the best they can be. And I think that that ultimately is a what I describe as a high performance environment because everyone's got different abilities there's, there's always going to be there's, there's got to be a ceiling at some stage hasn't there because that, you know that that's the reality you know world records don't get broken every time someone goes on the track you know there are, there are ceilings that take some pushing but that doesn't mean that you can't create an environment where as many people within your organization are performing at the best of their abilities or they're maximizing their potential so you're not always going to be performing right at the peak of your powers but you can create a situation where they have the opportunity to, to perform at the Beacon of Power. And I think that, that for me, is what high performance is about. So it reminds us of another guest when we were joined by Phil Neville, who said to us, do the best you can with what you've got where you are, which is mm. exactly what you're describing for of rugby. How do you create a culture at Exeter where people feel empowered to be the best they can with what they've got where they are and how they, how they know, probably through a feedback loop, that they're operating to the best? Because lots of business people that listen to this are really interested in the take the direct takeaways from the sporting world i think in i think there's two things that need to be remembered here because obviously it's a it's a team sport so what you've got to try and do you've got to try and create that maximizing of individuals but then actually the maximizing of the team and they are they can actually be slightly different things because and and i think for me that's the key if someone said to me what's my, what is my job more than anything else at the club, wrapping up the team, the individual players, the whole thing, I would say it probably wrap it up in the work kind of like alignment, really. And when I say that, what I mean is that you align all the little bits that come together on a daily daily basis. But what is the goal? What is what is the success? And the very simple success is you win you win the game of rugby at the weekend. The game of rugby that if you win that game of rugby, then that creates the other things that are important for a business or the club or the business side of the club. So that um, ability to stay in the Premiership straight away. So you've got to you've got to stay there at the high end of the of the game. Your ability to attract people to come and watch, so you you can create um, and sponsors to get involved and people to see the positive things about the fact that there's some success there. The other thing that obviously winning games of rugby is you become a more attractive proposition for potentially England selectors, Scottish selectors, Welsh selectors look at. So your players have potentially more opportunity to be successfully individually. If they're successful individually, if they're good players in the winning side, they like to get good contracts or good offer contracts from either us or other sides. And so you start to align the process of, yes, you want your individuals to understand that by working hard, doing the best they can, as you say, in that best time is important for them. But then they also have to buy into what makes the team successful. So aligning, helping them work through the bits and pieces that help them be as good as they can, but then them understanding that actually there's going to be games, there might even be seasons where we might have a game plan that isn't exactly what they want it to be. But they, you build an understanding with them that by aligning with the, the team's goals, the team's strategies, the team's plans, that success together is actually success individually as well in men, in many ways because you know if you're in a team that's losing every week you can be a very very good individual player but actually if the things you're doing are hurting the side are you a good individual player you know your your abilities might be fantastic but are you really a good player in a team game if what you're doing is hurting the side and so I would say that's that's for me for my my job really I would say is about alignment and I've I've always said, I think the days we are a very, very good side is when I look and I can see the 15 guys are on the field. They're aligned. They understand each other's roles. They understand it makes us a stronger team. They understand that them having the responsibility for their pieces allows the whole team to thrive. And, and the individual and collective thriving really does go hand in hand. It, it genuinely does. You know? and, and I think if you can gain an understanding of that, that 
that will also build that resilience of when things aren't quite right, what do you get back to? And there's those core fundamentals of my roles, my responsibilities within, within the team. How can I push those a little bit harder? How can I help other people keep to their kind of their part of the deal, so to speak? And I think those are the keys. Once you get an understanding of that, you can become quite a strong entity because, you know, 15 guys were all heading in this direction. You know, there's a lot stronger than 15 guys who are heading off this direction. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious which one's going to be quite a dynamic, forceful uh, and gain momentum and which one's just going to dissipate all its energy. Good I love that, Rob. And I think it, I think the way you've explained it there is the art of great coaching to make it really simple and accessible for us. I'd like to delve into some of the specifics though, because the way you describe this requires a selflessness in many ways that people have to buy into that team ethic. So how do you deal with people that might come with egos and maybe do have that individual um, perspective and can't see the wider picture? How do you sort of integrate them into that and make them aware of it? I, I think this is where it's really important to, to, to kind of build relationships with people. But I think it's also important that it doesn't happen immediately. I, I, one thing that I've learned more than anything else over, over the last probably five or six years, more than anything else, is you've got, you've got layers of coaching and understanding that you put in over a period of time and that they'll, they'll add to each other if you, can, if you can move them in the right way. So I think a perfect example to me is where you say it's, self, it's selfless. There's a degree of selflessness. Yes, there is, but there also isn't. And I think it's, ex- it's explaining this to, the, to those players who maybe don't get it. Because as I, said, as I said to you, yes, a player may not quite agree with the, a direction of travel. And you have this in a lot of circumstances. We have p- with people with strong beliefs, strong identities, however you want, uh, uh, strong abilities. But once they actually do start to get their heads around the fact that that success for them individually will will largely come based on a success of the group or a, a certainly an appearance that the group is successful and dynamic together, I think then you start to break down it because it doesn't become selfless then. It actually becomes quite weirdly almost selfish because you, you can get that person to suddenly go, actually, if I do this bit really well for the team in the way I should, the better I do it, the more successful we are. People are going to talk about me in a more obvious way people are going to want to reward me in a more obvious way i'm actually going to benefit from all the all the good things that come all the trappings all the all the things that come with success all the things that other people will look in and go what why is that team doing so well that player must really be contributing he must be a you know some guys who probably aren't what you describe as leaders from the outside will get talked about as leaders and they'll get talked about as people driving the culture and actually what they're doing is they're just really good followers you know, they're really powerfully, really good followers. And so you can see that the outside perception can actually be very, very um, positive for people who just actually twig, actually, that being an important part and being aligned in the team is what will make you actually more successful. And that can actually, some people could say that could be quite selfish. If you do it in a very, very good way, some people could say that's quite, actually quite selfish because you're, you're actually focused on, actually, this will be, have a really positive and strong outcome for me. And when you align the two, that those people, individuals, sorry, those individuals who, are, who really understand that it's a positive outcome for them, then, then that's when you become that group who can have a real positive impact together as well. So can you give us some of the tips and tricks that you'd adopt? So I'll give you an example to illustrate where I'm going with this. I, a friend of mine is, a, is a, a Brett Hodgson, the head coach of Hull in Rugby League. One of the things that he does in training was they have a rule where you have to hand a drink when you have a drinks break, for example, you hand the drink to your teammate before you take it for yourself. And that idea of getting you to understand that you need to look after your teammate before you, your own self-interest. Can you give us some of the examples of the tips and tricks that you might adopt to embed that within that culture uh, here down in Exeter? I, th- I think one of the things that I'd, I've repeatedly done, and I won't, I won't give you the exact name of the, of the, of the films I use because obviously they're tr- semi-trade sure. secrets, there are quite a lot, and, and it, it doesn't take a lot of research if you're looking for them, quite a lot of things like kind of old black and white war films or uh, with a variety of forces and a variety of messages. But if you actually do a bit of digging and you actually watch a few, so many of them, especially the ones that were, that were built, that were made not, not long after the war, so they were like trying to depict areas of battle or arenas of things that were going on. So many of them have got quite a strong message running through them where 
the commanding officer or the guy who's in charge or, or whatever, all his men love him. They think he's amazing. But re- and they think he's amazing because actually he's, he's, tr- he's thinking he's trying to keep them alive. So he's making excuses as to why they shouldn't go out on a mission or why they shouldn't jump in their plane or what, why it is. And, and the guys love him because they think he's protecting them. And, and then they get seen as a, a, an area of the force that's not doing very well. They're not achieving their aims. People are getting killed or whatever. And a new guy comes in in command and they all hate him. Because what does he do? He's a taskmaster. He drives them. He drills them. He trains them. He makes sure that they have very high standards. And they're all there for the first, for the first part of them going, this guy's awful. This is and of course, what actually what they realize though over the course of the outcome of the film is the guy who cares the most is the guy who drills them, drives them, trains them, gets them working hard together, gets them working as a unit. Because you're more likely to succeed or be successful in a war environment if you know what you're doing and you all have responsibilities, and you're all there for each other, and the timing's all aligned. And you, in, in an in a Air Force situation, you call it flying in formation. You know, World War II bombers, you fly in formation, you cover each other with your guns. If one guy's not in formation, everybody's weaker. And these, these environments, we, I use quite a lot of films and clips, and stuff, just to get, especially, especially when you think younger guys now who are coming into our team, they're about the age of most of the characters who are in those kind of war films that being that like 18 to 21, 22. Now for those guys, success meant staying alive for a day or staying alive for a mission or staying alive through a period of war. For our guys, I say to them, look, it's not, you can't compare it. It's about you winning the game of rugby. But these things are exactly the same. If you commit to your part, your role, your piece in the formation, we're all protected. We're all better. We're all stronger together. The minute you kind of want to decide to fly out of formation or go off on your own, we all become a bit weaker. You you become vulnerable and we become weaker. So I try and use quite a lot of things that particularly people nowadays will look at. And you, you know, as well as I do, a lot of the young people now, it's all about video clips and things they can see and things they can hear and things they can buy into. So I try and use that repeat message of, uh, of any opportunity you get to show where you can be stronger and safer and more resilient together that's what I try and do. I just try and show them in a different environment what it looks like. And obviously, and for obvious reasons, the military environment is a very, very important one because yeah. you actually protect each other by being pretty tough on each other. And, and that's what you need in quite a high performing sports situation as well. It's a very interesting conversation. This about everyone going in the same direction, Rob. Um, and coming back to the, the title of our conversation, building resilience to deal with stress, I'd be really interested to know what this is like for you to operate in. Because when you were a player and you played for the Chiefs for 14 years, captained them for a, for a decade, you were part of that formation of planes flying in the same direction. Now you're not. You're kind of a plane maybe over here saying, right, you, you're not quite in the right direction. You need to go fly a bit closer, you further away. <clears throat> you're kind of in charge. So it's a, you're part of it, but you're separate from it. How hard is that for you to deal with from being central to it to being in charge I, I don't mind telling you i think the hardest thing um is to keep saying to the same group of people almost this this same message because it's so true there isn't really a, there isn't really an easy way out of it right. so rugby now top line rugby is a ma- massively physical sport so personally i don't mind telling you the hardest thing i get to for, for me is to keep saying to these guys right well actually for us say that i'm flying in formation might mean for 20 minutes, there's going to be a lot of tough carries out there. Everyone's full of energy. Everyone's trying to smash each other. Actually, what success? What is success for you? Well, success for you today is going to be you're going to batter yourself around for 20 minutes and it's going to hurt. And there's going to be some compromise out. There's going to be some injuries. There's going to be, it's going to be tough. And so I think that's the tough bit. That tough bit is repeatedly saying the same message about how hard you actually have to work, how tough this, you, you might have to be today to actually make all this work. And that is the bit, because I think when you're a captain and you're part of the team and you go out there and you can look at each other and go, this is going to be tough today, guys. Whatever happens, we're going to have to wear them down. We're going to go through a bit of some hard times out there. When you're in there and you're kind of in the trenches fighting together, it is a little easier. And I actually think that that is one of the toughest parts, isn't it? The t- one of the toughest parts of leadership is being able to go, I want you to go out there and really, you know, almost sacrifice yourself. And uh, I'll be sat here watching, like in the warm and, you know, 
we'll catch up yeah. again afterwards. And I, I, but I think, but I think that that's just one of those things. That's one of those character traits you need to be comfortable doing. Because again, but I think you find comfort in yourself. You deal with your own resilience, your own stress by going. Well, actually, but I still know this is for the for the good of this player. This if this guy wants a good contract, if he wants to be successful, if he wants international honours, if he wants to be the player he wants to be and have the success he wants to be, these are the things he's going to have to commit to doing. And I think that's how you can keep round, rounding it back. It's it's all it's all little parts, little segments of the same circle that you keep going round and revisiting. What do you have to do, and where does that lead to the success back at the top? And then what do you have to do, and how does that lead back to? And I think I think we're all have a slightly different role to play on that. What was it, Rob, that built your resilience to be able to stand there, keep having those conversations, keep sipping that coffee in the warm while the game is going on um, without feeling that you're being judged by the players or maybe feeling that maybe you are being judged, but you have the resilience to deal Mm. with that. You know, the media, all the other things that come with your role, because being the captain of a rugby team doesn't necessarily give you the resilience to be a really good director of rugby. So where do you think you learned the resilience for your specific role now? Uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I'll be honest with you. you, you if, if if there's any director of rugby who ever sits there and watches and doesn't feel they're being judged by virtually everybody, including the team and everybody who's in this grind, I'd be amazed because they they must be able to go to go home and sleep really well at night. I feel quite envy. I feel quite envious <laughs> of them. But I would say I would think it's one of those things. That I think being a captain of the side in the time I played did help me because it's different to being a captain of a, the full time professional side now where you, you do make a few decisions, but, but there's so much other input happening around you. Um, I mean, back when I started captain, you were still you were still involved in selection and still involved in elements of all, of training and how the game was going to be played and what you're going to do. And the you know you you were the, the key speaker at after uh, end of season dinners and and the such like. So I think those kind of things they prepare you in a slightly different way because you you're kind of a you're kind of a semi player coach. Uh, a, a, uh, and a per, and an off-field persona all wrapped into one. And I think that can start the process. And then I, I was really fortunate when I started coaching. And one, if anybody ever says to me, asked me about a, co- uh, a coaching pathway and how they should start, I started coaching next university. And I think those environments really help you because you're there, you're there working with players who have a great deal of resilience as well. Mm. Because you turn up... Uh, and the guys who turn up there on their first day, they're uh, as freshers on their first day, they turn up because they want to be part of something. They want to be part of something. They want to be part of a team. It's they're, they're doing it off their own back. There's no financial reward there. They're doing it because they want to be part of something. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And you're there and you help them guide guide that. And that's a very rewarding side of it. And I think and I think really it's no different. It, it might feel like it when you get to a professional level, but but the truth is it is still kind of the same. You are there to guide these guys who want to be part of something and they want to achieve things for themselves, yes, and they want to achieve things together. And I think you kind of rationalize it by saying, well, these guys want to be here and it's my job to try and help them do it in the most successful way possible. And yes, you're going to be judged and yes, they'll, they, they'll judge you and they should judge you. But I think as long as you can, you can always kind of say to yourself, well, yeah, but I'm genuinely thinking we are heading in the right direction. This is a way for these people to be success, successful. I think you can certainly rationalize it, rationalize it with yourself. And that's the important thing in the end of the day, isn't it? At the end of the day, to be able to get to the end of the day and go, I've done what I can do today, I've done the right thing. And I think that's probably the, the way I deal with it. Do you find leadership lonely, Rob? Um, yes and no. Probably a little less now than I did, but but that probably comes from having that element of a, a bit of, I suppose, what would you call it, credit in the bank, maybe? Maybe, yeah. maybe that's the way of doing it, in that I've had a, an element of success now as a leader which probably is allowing me over the last three or four years to definitely share roles and responsibilities a little bit more. Like I've got a very good coaching staff at the club. We've been together for a long time. We've got a lot, a lot of trust amongst ourselves. And, and I still think um, our biggest strength is that we kind of we can work our way back to alignment very well. We will, we will argue and disagree and uh, not, not necessarily fall out. Because I wouldn't say fall out to the stage where you know, there's a there's day spent where we're, we're disagreeing, but in in the course of a, a half hour, an hour, or even longer discussion about where we're going, how we're playing, where the season's going, how a particular game went, we can we can really have some varied ideas on it. But but we always manage to work our way back into to that kind of alignment process of how we're moving forward, and and I think that's that's allowed it to become a little bit more comfortable. I think I think before then I'd said yeah, well it was pretty lonely because you, you're kind of 
ultimately you are making the end decisions that yeah. especially when we were first in the premiership you know the difference between us being in the premiership or being relegated is massive the 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 the, the almost the, the gap is that that last step between the championship and the premiership is such a big one now that i think it's you know you you are looking around and seeing tens of people who would lose jobs lose, lose yeah. livelihoods have to move into different different areas would would have would not be able to carry on in the roles with the way they're doing their family responsibilities mortgages when you look at it like that you know, that that initially was a was was a big thing um i think now we're a lot more established how so how did you learn to cope with that loneliness and to carry such a heavy burden i mean at the end of the day i've, I've got a very supportive family i mean i've, I've been with my wife since uh, i was 16 she was 17 we've been you know married 30 years in in june so i we've always been i've always been able to talk talk to her about it and i think that's the thing as well i think i have i have always and i'm from a farming background and i, and I still live here on the farm and i do think that it, it it gives you a bit of stoicism that you know you can get on with things you know, I, I I say to other people, and they say, "Well, how does how's being a farmer and how's it affected various things?" And, and one of the big things I always say to them is, "There are loads of things you do on a farm, and any any farm will tell you this. And you can look in a field sometimes, and it's co- not co- covered in square bales of hay. We used to, we used to do square bales of hay, which you all need to be picking up by hand. And you can look in a big field, and you can see these thousands of bales just sitting there. And you know they've all got to get picked up before it rains, and you know they've all got to get back, get put in the shed before it rains. And you look at it, and you go, "We'll never finish this." But you, you know what you do? You drive in there with a tractor and trailer and you start chucking them on one at a time. And then a few days later, it's done. And that to me is very much the way to look at most things in life. You know, there's a lot of things that look quite daunting and look that semi-impossible or oh, this will never get done. And guess what? You know, you, you you take your first step, you pick up your first bale of hay and you look around and, it, and it's done, isn't it? And I think that's that's probably how I deal with most things is today hasn't gone so well, but we've got tomorrow and we've got the next day. Um, and if we go that one hard, the, the job will get finished. And we've probably, that's probably been a mantra around the club for a long time. Well, I was going to follow up on, on this theme of resilience, Rob, and ask you that one of the things that often fascinates me is that I've never met anyone that needs to be resilient in a culture where they're treated with kindness and decency and empathy. I've met people that need to be resilient when you're being castigated or you're working with people that are unkind. So how have you fostered a culture where, of psychological safety, where people can come in, they can take risks, they can play the expansive rugby that you demand, and they're not afraid of making mistakes? I think this is, this is one of the things that probably, for me, is, it's one of the most talked about areas, isn't it, of, of kind of sport around this, um, maximise yourself without having a fear of mistakes. And I think, I think they often get talked about in the wrong way. Um, personally, and this is my personal view, and I don't, I'm not expecting everybody to agree with this on on the risk taking element of, of sport or how you do things. One of the worst things that, that I've kind of hear is when I hear people go, um, "Oh, I just thought I'd give it a go," or "Yeah, it's important they just give it a go," or you know, that kind of thing, because that to me is it, it almost sounds the opposite of a high performing environment. If I'm honest with you, so. When I, when I say that, I mean, there's there's no way really a, a, a top sportsman should give something a go that they don't know that they can do in a game environment. Because to me, you're what are you what are you kind of saying there? That you're kind of saying that off the top of the head, this person has just decided to do something. No one, no one else really knows. Now that's different to putting a skill in place that you have got that you've practiced and you've worked at and you know you're capable of achieving because then it's actually allowing yourself. So that becomes different because then it becomes about allowing yourself to use your talents and use your abilities. That's different. I think allowing yourself at the right time, that is, that is a, resi- a resilience under pressure. But I think that has to come from the, the armory you have built by working hard and by practicing and and knowing and creating the ability inside you and i think one of the one of the key times you'll see this is i would say things like like golf and tennis are really good examples of this so a, prof- a top professional tennis player will have spent hours and hours and hours days years of their life practicing 
how they hit a very basic stroke, a forehand. And they will practice for hours and repeatedly and repeatedly, even the very top professionals. When you watch them, they don't just go out and play a game of tennis and, and they'll oh, say, I've done, I practiced well today. They might hit 50 or 100 four, basic forearm cross. And they know that in a rally under pressure, that ball needs to be landing near a line, needs to be staying, staying, staying low over the net and needs to be getting to one side of the court or the other. So they know they've got the ability to do it. Now then in the game, what happens is you can be in a game, you can get to a really important point and you've got two choices. You can just get the ball back over the net again and hope the opposition make a mistake or you can let yourself keep making those shots you know you're capable of. So you, you, you kind of let that ability you have in you take over and make those shots so you go line to line just over the net puts the opposition under more pressure then they that's what that's what ultimately forces the mistake now that's the difference for me the difference is being able to let yourself go and let yourself express your talents and your abilities not just i'll give it a go because if you're just hitting a line because you've given it a go that's not good play that's luck yeah they're different things same with a golfer a golfer who he can go for it and he knows he's got the ability through hours of practice to, to put a ball near the pin but he also might know that there's a bunker at the back if it goes a little hard so he can lay up keep dropping it in there short or he can let himself actually play the shot that he knows he can play and yes and he deals with the he deals with the pressures of the outcomes but he's not just giving it a go. He isn't just said, oh, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll change the club this time and I'll just do this. And it's, it's always, there's, always a, there's always been a plan. There's always a reason. They're, they're the good guys. They're the successful people. They have that ability to let, let their abilities come out, they, but they don't just give something a go. If you see what I mean, I think they're different things. I think the understanding of that is really important. And it takes a bravery and resilience to do it, doesn't it? Because you have to be willing to fail and know that, if you play the riskier game, the rewards are greater, but the failure is much more apparent and much closer to you, doesn't it? I think it depends again, you see, because is it is it risky? So that tennis player, is it, it for him to win or lose the game, is it riskier him playing the good shots he knows he's capable of than maybe the odd occasion he goes over the line? Or is it riskier him just putting the ball back over the net and then the opposition absolutely smashing one back that he can't play? So this is where the risk, this is what I mean. What, it's not really risky. It, it's, it, and, that, and that's the bit that you've got to, once everybody starts to get that part of it, because you're actually allowing yourself to be successful. Now, what I would say is where the resilience comes into this is your ability to get to that level where you let yourself go means you actually have to commit everything to the game, the game you're involved in. You have to be prepared to commit everything to it. Now, if you commit everything to something, and you lose, that's heartbreaking. Because you sit there afterwards and you go, I don't know if I could have done any more today. I've lost. And, and it's the ability to actually prepare to get go to that level as often as possible that really moves you on. Because if you can then repeat that the next time, you will actually already be in a, a able to deal with the scenario a little bit better. And then again, and then again. And so you'll slowly be able to claim the, climb the ladder of performance because you are committing everything to it whether, whether you win or lose what you what you need to remember is it's very difficult especially in modern society for people to actually go that far yeah because and, and i can give you a perfect example i bet you must have heard hundreds of times someone say something to you like um uh i oh i, I ran a rate I, I ran my usual race today whether i was i was a couple seconds slower than normal uh but that's okay because i didn't have a great training week last week or um, I've, I was ill a couple of weeks and I think that's probably counted that, you know, how many times you say a kid, uh, hear a child go, Oh yeah, I didn't do so well in my exam, but it's okay. Cause I can revise a bit harder next time. And that's what we do. We always try and li- we, we, we put limiting things in before we go out and perform. And actually to really excel, you've got to go, right, whatever happens today, this is, this is a chance for me to have the game in my life. I don't make taking any excuses and I'm not, and that's it. And then you lose and you go, oh, that's horrible. I don't know if I could have done any more. But that's what you have to do. You have to do that again, don't you? You have to do that again, and that's yeah. how you get better. If you're always limiting yourself, you're never going to reach your potential. You're never going to actually go there. You've got to actually try and be the best you can be in every performance. So take us into a dressing room after a premiership final then, where your players have given everything, as did happen on a number of occasions, Rob, yeah. and yet they've still lost the game. How do you remind them of those messages and then 
give them the resilience to come back stronger the season after? Now the message is a little easier for me than the, probably the first time it happened. Yeah. Um, because now there's, there's guys there, A, who have been involved themselves or have seen it historically by, by knowing what our results have been, that we've lost finals and come back and won, won the following year or won two years later. And that's when you can start to talk about that, that level of performance and going out there in that environment and letting it all out. That's been one of the crucial steps for you to maybe be in a winning trophy in the future. And, and I think that's very much how you've, you've got to address it like that. The first year, it was also, it was a different situation because then I could tell them, well, we, we needed the experience of this. No, I don't think we had a person in the room who'd been in the Premiership, even been in a Premiership semi-final, right. not a Premiership final. And so having that, that experience, and we, and we won the next year, and that was a huge stepping stone for us. Actually being in, I think, I think the year we were first in the Premiership final was the first year we'd been in the top four of the Premiership. It was the first year we'd been in the semi-final, and obviously it was certainly the first year we'd been in the final. And, and we needed those experiences, and, and we needed that, and we needed to f- understand what it would feel like and what we could do better the next time. And I think you can talk a lot like that. And I think you need to remember, if you were kind of talking in an environment where you're always saying, look, we're going to go through a bit of heartbreak, but we're going to expose ourselves to it because it will make us stronger and it will make us better, then it, it's just the biggest step on the on the path of that of the, that you're kind of aware of, and I still I still think it's the it's the biggest part of development. The, the biggest the biggest thing is exposing yourself to kind of I call it heartbreak. It could be anything, and it could be uh, the, exposing yourself to failure, but not because you're, it's okay to fail. You know, expose yourself to failure when it's not okay to fail, and you want desperately to win. That's the best way to move forward because if if you're accepting you're going to there's a chance you might lose or you might not you might not commit fully to the game before you go into it you're never going to develop to the same extent as you can if you're going to put everything into it both both physically and mentally it's 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 the same thing we actually hear quite often on this podcast rob from people in your position that the difference between the emotion of winning and the emotion of losing is actually relatively small you get that great win and the next morning you've moved on anyway because you're ready for the next game you get the defeat, you've moved on because you're ready for the next game. How do you go about explaining that to your players? Well, it, it, this is there's a very simple way of explaining. It. I mean, we've we've been we're involved in these kind of games all the time. So um a perfect example is you lose you lose a game with the last kick of the game. They get a penalty. So maybe just inside your half kick it. I mean, we won we won one last week, didn't we, against Northampton with it. Um there's a very simple way of explaining it because you can sit in the changing room and like you say, the, emo- the, the, the difference between the emotion of winning and losing has been based, you could say, based on, on one kick. So you can sit there and go, right guys, for 79 minutes and 30 seconds, if we'd have done everything we'd done, as we'd done it, and that kick misses, we'd be sitting here now pretty pleased with the win. The only difference in the performance might be that kick, that kick doesn't hit the post, that kick's gone over. So that's why you move on. Because that's how close it can be. Now, obviously, you, you have to break down the game into way bigger parts than that. And you have to look when you talk to your players about it, right. But if we'd have improved A, B, C here, A, B, C, it might never have come down to one kick. And that's how you move on. But actually, the line between winning and losing in some games is, very, is so small that it's that, that, and it creates such a big flip, as you say, emotionally, that as long as you talk about it and you're open about it and you express that to each other, you should be able to move on relatively quickly because what are you moving on for? You'd, you'd still have the same work on if you'd have won. If that kick misses, all the things you've done wrong in that game, you've still done wrong and they all still need working on. If the, if the kick goes over, they're all the same things. They all need the same amount of work on, don't they, to improve them. And I think as long as you can talk about it quite openly, it's, it shouldn't be the hardest thing to get your head around. And do you think a healthy environment is one where we hugely celebrate our successes and we all go out and have a couple of nights on the drink or we party till all hours but then if we're going to do that when we get defeated we have to get low and we have to really suffer with a lot of introspection or is a healthier environment not just sport but in life itself one where we kind of avoid creating that roller coaster of emotions i just i think you've come up with exactly the right words there roller, roller coaster of emotions I'm, i remember when i first took the job it was one of the first things um that i talked to everybody about the players the staff uh, the club even the supporters that the most important thing we're in the premiership was to avoid exactly what you said. We're not going to be on a roller coaster of emotions. We're not going to say we're amazing when we win and we're not going to say we're awful when we lose. And actually in our first season, of the premiership, we talked about enjoying every game, win or lose, because it was the first experience for a lot of our players that they were even in playing at that level of rugby. And so what you do is you go, right, well, we'll, 
we're not we're not coming to the Premiership just to sit here and worry about it every week, and we're not going to try and eke out winning you know six six nine games and all this type of stuff, or see if we can scrape through. We're going to enjoy every weekend. It might be our, it might I remember even saying to last this might be our one season. We're in the Premiership. We're going to enjoy every weekend. If we travel to Welford Road and front, front playing front of a sellout crowd, we're going to love it. And we're going to do the same at Gloucester. We're going to do the same at Northampton. All the places the guys hadn't played, and that's what we did. And we avoided that roller coaster. And I think I think the other thing that's really important around resilience is you, there's no, you have to change. Obviously, you have to change and you have to adapt and you have to move forward. But you also have to have your your own identity. And I think one of the key things we did in the Premiership when we first came into it was we didn't try and be everybody else. Um, and when I when I say that, what I mean is our first game of season, first game we played against Gloucester. At home. Unfortunately, we won, and that allowed us to have some faith in what we were doing. Great. The next week, we went to Leicester and we lost. Now, the real temptation is so you look at that game, you break it down, you analyze it, and there was loads of things that we we could have learned from Leicester and some of the things they did. But if I go into the team on Monday and go right, well, look what Leicester did here, look what Leicester did there, look what Leicester did there, they were successful at that. I think we need to think about doing that. But then the next week, you play someone else and they might beat you. And then if you go in on Monday, you go, well, hold on a minute. Well, Northampton just beat us, but they did this and they did this and they did this. That's what we should be doing. You can see that actually, what are you doing? You're just lurching along, you know, you're overreacting to every every little thing that's happening every week instead of just ticking along, just getting a bit better. Yeah, I mean, we, we took things out of every game and over periods of time, we learned from other premiership sides. But we what we probably learned from other premiership sides, we instilled in us over probably seasons. We, we certainly didn't try and do it week by week. We had, a, we had a bit of a style of how we wanted to play, uh, Got had faith in it, tried to get better at doing it, and used the games. And I think this is probably the important thing. We used the games as the biggest training session of the week. So we had a style about, we talked about how we wanted to play, but actually the, what we really drove with the players was your opportunity to really do this, to absolutely flat out and train the best is in the game. So that, that allows you to then talk to your players about getting touches on the ball, be involved in the ball, in the game, because... You'll be better. You, the, the more touches the ball you have, the more involved you are. That's how you get better. You're playing in a good environment against better players. All these things, you know, getting gamers, they'll all improve you. So all, all we ever really spoke about was where, where the upward path was, not where, not really where the downward one was. And I think for, for the first two or three seasons, that, that established a level of um, faith and desire and an emotional stability within the club and I think it's, it's got to be in the club it's, you can talk about being in a team and that's important but that emotional stability needs to be across, across the club because if you're if your MD is wandering into the changing room every five minutes screaming because you haven't won a game of rugby there's no emotional stability in the club at all is there you know and and we've we've managed to have that um in in really good measure at the club for, for a number of years now and I think that speaks fundamentally Rob to you know, like how lots of clubs have these sort of slogans on the wall or their value statements, and then they don't always act up to it or use them um, as wallpaper rather than as, as as guidance. I know that when you first came up, you had this idea of ACE, which was around attitude, commitment and enjoyment. But what I think is more significant is the way that you've evolved those, where it became grace, which was about including graft, um, and respect for others. And now you've had it, it's all about me. So there are three iterations of these values that really intrigue me. How did you come to them and how did you decide to update them and add things or, or refresh them? Well, without sounding like the old textbook coaching manual, <laughs> obviously, you know, we're, all of us who've, who've done any kind of courses or all this kind of stuff, you know, you talk about like empowerment and uh, and, and players taking some some element of responsibility for your what your as you say what your kind of culture leadership leadership uh, issues will be, um, but I, and I, which I think is which I think is very good and very important. But I think good leadership needs to lead, guide that and lead that a little bit as well. So what we did was we I, I created like a, a questionnaire and it was based around um, just just tell me your three. It was either three or four most important things the things you want other people to see in us as a, as a team and the things you want to have in our team itself so not just what was introspective and what we wanted to see inside but how do we want to be viewed by other people right? it's kind of like two questions and what happened then is you obviously you come up with a load of uh, a list you know, when there's 40 50 people 
putting in there, even if it's three or four things, you come up with quite a big list of words. You know, you kind of relentless, uh, a dominant, um, you know, there's a lot of the rugby words in there that you can see, you know, combative, physical, fast, um, you know, all, all that tough, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then there's also an, an emotional level of words that come out. And that's where like an enjoy, enjoyment came out there three or four times with players um, being, emo, being emotional or um, uh, showing we care, all this type of stuff. So there was emotive things in there as well. And actually when I broke them down, um, what I did was I kind of put all the words that come back into three categories and they were like, they were kind of physical, um, a, a physical category and an emotional category. And then there was a third one that was kind of like a, um, what would you call it? It looks like a, like a team, like a team category, a collective category of what it could be. So there was like almost like an individual thing, a collective thing and an emotional thing. And that's where the ACE came from because actually it, the, they broke down into those categories. They broke down into a category that was all about your attitude, so your mental approach. There was a, a, a category that was all about your physical approach. And then there was a category that was about your emotional approach. So ACE, really, attitude is your, um, your, your mental approach to the game. How are you, how are you going to approach it? What are the qualities you're going to show mentally and, and the emotion that people see it? And then the middle one was actually your preparation. What's your commitment to getting physically prepared? How hard are you going to work? Are you going to be on time? Are you going to maximize your weight sessions? Are you going to maximize your running sessions? You know, are you going to eat and sleep, do all the right things? And then the third one, the enjoyment one, was the emo- it was that emotional one about how are we going to feel about what we're doing? Okay. So that's why ACE came about. So it was, it was empowered by the players and the elements they wanted, and then it was streamed into those three categories. And those three categories have really been the backbone of nearly everything we've done when you talk about culture at the club ever since. And although we've added to them, we've added them to add a little bit of a little bit of change and a little bit of freshness. But if you think when you add grace and you add graft on top of attitude, they're kind of similar things. But the players wanted to just develop them and push them on a little bit. And of course, the respect one was really important because it was our second year in the Premiership. And and I asked the guys who put respect because a lot of guys put respect, and I asked them what they meant by it. And they said, "We want to show respect for other people, but we want to earn respect as well." And so they really used it as a two-way, like a, two, like a mirror almost, of what they wanted the team to be about, a team that could demand respect, but also respected what they had and the opportunities they had and how they behave with each other. And, and I think that's really important. But I think that's what you need to do. You need to, you need to make sure players are aware. If they're going to come up with a, a, a culture thing or, or, or identity, they need to be aware what are the areas that that should address. And obviously, it should address your, your, your individual stuff around your training and your prep how you're committed to each other and your group stuff and, and what you want to achieve. And then what's the emotional side of it? What, what do you want to get out of it? Because I, I don't mind telling you when you first become a leader or you first get your responsibility, you don't spend a lot of time walking around talking about enjoyment. You genuinely yeah. don't. You start, you do, but you talk about you know, schedules and timing and weight training and protein shakes and everything that's like, seems really serious. And then when a few players turn around and go, well, bro, I, tell you, we, I want to really enjoy it. I want to really enjoy coming in training. I want to really enjoy playing for this rugby side. And you stop and you, you, take, you, you stop for a little while and you go, actually, that's probably really important. That's probably the most important part. If the guys are enjoying coming into training, it, 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 and I think this is the bit, you, when you sort of talk about enjoying, enjoying coming in training, it's not because they come in and play a bit of football and don't do very much, because a good guy will want to be successful. So he'll actually, and, and I talk a lot to players about this, the only, the only thing that's really enjoyable when you get home at the end of the day and you sit down, if you spent seven or eight hours at the rugby club, you know, there's two ways you can feel, feel when you get home. You can feel like that was a day well spent. I'm a better person, a better player. I've given myself a chance to achieve the goals I want to achieve. Or you can go, that was a bit of a waste of time. And there's, that, that's what's different. You can enjoy one and the other one, even if it might have been fun at the time, but because there wasn't much going on, you're not going to look back on it and think it was an enjoyable day. You're going to look back with a bit of dissatisfaction. And so I think enjoyment is very, very important if you, if you also explain what enjoyment means and how you, how you gather it together and approach it. So is that a question you ask yourself at the end of every day then, Rob? Yeah, often, often. I'll, I'll get home often and, you know, one of the first things I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my wife about, I'll say, it's been a good day today. You know, you, you can just tell, you know, it's been a good day today. We've, we've achieved a lot. It's, it's incredible how much, you know, on a day-by-day basis, you can feel things are moving in a positive direction because most of the time they're only very small, but they don't have to be very big. If, you, if you're doing quite well, you only have to find little bits 
Um, and sometimes that can be as much as watching a really good training session. Sometimes it can be watching a young player really train well or really show or or you do a review with a young player and, and you're just looking at some of the things they're doing and how they've moved on from the last week. And they're all little things, but they're all positive and they all they all create that momentum that we're all kind of craving for. Oh. So interesting. Um, Rob, we've reached the point of our conversation where we throw a few quick fire questions at you. Um, and the first one is, what are the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you need to buy into? I'll be honest with you, we probably don't have three. It's, I mean, I would, we would probably just wrap it up into like, to just to work, work hard. And, that, and, and we probably talk about that more than anything else. That's probably where Graft came into it all those years ago. Just work hard. But when you say work hard and people go, oh, it, but what's non-negotiable as you work hard at everything. Now you need to remember, you know, that means working hard at building relationships with people and, you know, and learning about other people and knowing what makes each other tick. You know, that's part of working hard. Working hard isn't just, you know, how many reps on the bench press can I do right now? Cause I've got to work hard at doing it. You know, that also means, you know, you, you work hard at enjoying what you do. You know, you work hard at, uh, being with people, enjoying your time together, enjoying grabbing a coffee together, and enjoying talking to each other about last night's TV, if that's an important thing to you. So it's 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 an understanding of working hard, you know, across the board in the things that are important. It's not it's not as it's not just saying like you know it's a physical thing. It needs to be a a life thing, really. Brilliant. We can we can break that down then. Work hard, enjoy it, and do it consistently. How about those three? Very very relevant. <laughs> yeah, very relevant. <laughs> Rob, if you could go back to one moment in your life, what would it be and why? It's funny because I get asked this quite a lot because I think everyone thinks that I'll just drop it back to being like a rugby thing. If, if someone say, if someone say I could go back to a time in my life, it would probably be, I don't know, probably probably when my kids were like ten and ten and seven. Um, I think I, I think I'd just I think I'd I'd been finishing finished playing rugby for a year or two, was just getting into coaching. That looked like it was starting to take off for me. So I was kind of almost like starting a second career. And they were, the kids were at that age where, and everyone knows this, who's, who's gone through with kids who have grown up, like mine are 25 and 22 now and left home. You have that period where they still really need you, but they have enough independence to do things for themselves. Everything you do with them is just brilliant. It's just, it's that perfect time in your life where you're just getting on with stuff. Everyone seems happy. Things are still pretty magical for kids at that age. And, you know, you can, you know, I remember spending around the time that age, you know, the year before, two, two or three years after summers at the summers at the beach when we could get down there and just do little things where they're just, they're, they're just everything. Family life that felt very positive for me. Like I said, I was getting a new experience. I was really enjoying getting into coaching. I would go back, I would go back then more than I would go back to sitting in the Twickenham stands when we won our first final. I mean, that was great, but that's not a, that's not a fulfilling life moment for you when you know when other things are happening well thank you for sharing that that's that's really beautiful thank you uh rob if you could recommend one book for the listeners of our podcast that's had an impact on you which one would you go for i think the, the book that really piqued my bigger interest around what what being a director of rugby really is um was probably um patriot rain i mean i've i'm a bit of a a bit of a watcher of american football um, and so I kind of, when I found the book, I kind of read it and that, that, cause that explained very much about how they started to create an organization that dealt with all the elements of, of a successful team club, you know, business, however you wanted to do it. And I, I found that really interesting. And to be fair, you know, if, if people want to watch anything, anything that uh, if a coach wants to watch something that can help you tell a story, you know, the, the America's games uh, vid video series is, is, is incredible because if you're prepared to watch enough of them, you can find so many different stories. You know, there's there's teams that have been awful one year, win the Super Bowl the next year. Yeah. There's teams that have just missed out on winning the Super Bowl, follow up and win it the next year. There's teams that have won it one year and they do the impossible, win it a second year. Or And there's all different stories and all different things there and coaches change and key players come in and key players come out. And you can actually use them to tell so many stories of resilience and change and development and uh, coming through adversity. But if you, you know, they're, they're very good. And I, we use quite a lot of clips to try and guide our players towards where, what, how you can deal with a poor start of a season, how you can deal with, how you can try and gain momentum later in the season, how you can deal with a raft of injuries or key players missing. Because the stories are there, the stories of success are there where they've been dealt with. 
And of course, they're, they're expressed so well because the quality of the film is so good and the quality of the stories are so good. So anything like that, that can help you tell a coaching story because that's what we do, don't we? As, as Like me, my, my job is to, is to tell a story that the, that the players follow and they believe and they're part of. You know, and that those things I find I find intriguing, really. How important is legacy to you? Um, yeah, it's, it's probably become... In weirdly, almost the defining thing in some ways, isn't it? Is that once you start getting success, is is how you hold on to it. And I, I see I've already said the wrong thing there because it's not that, is it? It's not. This is the problem. We all start thinking, right? We've got success now. We need to kind of hold on to it. And the worst thing in any sporting career, if if you're in a sporting career where you're clinging on by your fingernails, that's even worse than being a director of rugby who's trying to cling on to past success by your fingernails. The legacy is about building building the next team and the next title that that's how you that's legacy isn't it and i don't don't mean to say i have to keep reminding myself of it because you you even said it then you know i even i even i started saying it, didn't i yeah holding on to success because it's, it's our natural reaction it's not and i think that's probably what's been ex- I, i've really found refreshing since christmas this year and and i don't mind saying you know i've I feel like I found a little bit of a new a new energy and drive since Christmas, and I think our team has, and I think our results and our performances show that. Because I actually think, I actually think maybe we collectively, players and staff, were over focused on how we, not how we held on, but how we stayed where we were expected to be. And I think we were fortunate. We had a we had our, our week off around Christmas, and I obviously spent a couple of days at home and had a, a good bit of time pondering over stuff. And we actually re the clock a bit when we got in after Christmas. We, t- we went, we talked about a lot of the things you're hearing me talk about now, we started talking about again. Because we probably, and this is what I mean about layers, you, what you can, the, the worst you can do as a coach is you forget which players have got the layers that you've put in over seasons. And I actually think what had happened is we were, we were asking players to do stuff and a group of players to do stuff without realizing that not all of them had had the layers of experience and education and meetings and talks and, and all the things that we'd gone through with, with a bigger group of players who perhaps weren't there on the field. And what we did is we've, we've come back and we started adding the layers again. And, and one of the big layers we've added is to talk a lot more about enjoyment and fulfillment and heartbreak, being prepared to be heartbroken, all those things that were part of how we, we grew as a team to get some success, we've really started to talk about about how important they are as fundamentals within what we do week by week. And that's what we've done. We've started to try and add some layers again. It's been quite enjoyable, quite exciting, because now we genuinely feel like we're building on building towards our next piece of success rather than hanging in there with an expectation that we should we should be there. Because we shouldn't be there. We shouldn't be there. You've got to fight for it and you've got to you've got to you've got to deserve to be there. And that that's how we're acting at the moment. Brilliant. And our final question, Rob, is what would you like to leave the listeners or the viewers of this podcast with as your one golden rule for living a high performance life? I'm probably just going to repeat myself here. It's, it's probably like that, that work hard, play hard, genuinely. But when I say when I say play hard, it's a little bit like when I expanded on the work hard one before. You know, if you, you, you I don't know, when I say play hard, and they talk about rugby players, they go, "Oh, that means they're all going to get drunk and all this type of stuff after a game." And like, I, don't, I, I don't mean that. I mean. I mean, you work hard to enjoy the experiences that you, we would talk about as being, as being playing, playing hard. I mean, Richard Branson, I think, is a guy who spoke about this. He spends a lot of time making sure that his time off is really good time off. And I think that's important for professional rugby players, important for people in, in, in any life at all where you're busy and you have limited time. Make sure you work hard to enjoy that time off. Make sure that it's, it's valuable. Make sure you make the most of it because then... You, you start to enjoy everything. You become used to maximizing your opportunities at everything. And sometimes that opportunity might be you get a week off to go and sit in the sun. Well, if you do, and what you want to do is sit in the sun and read a book, great. Maximize that opportunity and go and do it. If you want to be out and you want to, you want to fulfill things, you want to go and see things, you want to go on, go and make sure you do. You know, work hard at enjoying yourself as well as working hard to be successful in the things you do. And, and as I said, just that's what it's about that that understanding that there's lots of ways you can you can push yourself to get what you want out of things is is how i describe what we'd like to try we we like to try and do with our players fantastic look rob thank you so much for taking the time to have a conversation with us um about this kind of thing because i think that the more that we can talk about building resilience to deal with stress the more we realize that actually building resilience allows us to to explore and do so many things and i think exploration is probably the 
the key word that leaps out to me from this conversation. And it's clear that you're someone who, by not holding on to what's happened before, you're constantly exploring. That exploration gives your players the layers that they require, the layers that you require. Um, it allows you to evolve. And I love the fact that after all these years of playing rugby and captaining a rugby kit team and now being in charge at Exeter, you've realised that the single most important thing is enjoyment. And uh, that's a great lesson to leave people with, I think. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks, Rob.